Now, uh, straw 2011. I'm quoting this study because just in case a short note is asked on straw 2011, you should not be zapped what to write. See, this is very important. You should know a little bit about some everything, a little bit, something about everything. Why? Because any answer left blank is very dangerous in theory examination. You know the past percentage in theory, so why to take chance? So a little bit you should know. And with my class, this is my aim to give emphasis on those things which you do not know anything about so that something stays in your mind with my class. So those are very old. See, it's 2011, it's 2023 going on. DNB people have a habit of asking questions which are just recent. But you never know what examiner is sitting to make the exam, to, the, to, to you know, kind of make the, frame the questions. So anyways, a little bit about straw 2011. Straw is nothing but stages of reproductive aging workshop. Stages of reproductive aging workshop. Menopause. Straw, menopause. Okay. What it has done is that it has divided the entire life of the woman into three phases. What are those three phases? I've marked it over here. Reproductive, menstrual, menstrual transition. Sorry, reproductive. That means normal menses is going on. You're not even close to uh, perimenopause. This is menstrual transition is perimenopause. And then comes postmenopause. Amongst which you have early, peak, late. Early, peak, late features. What are they? In which the principal criteria is menstruation. Because you are not going on FSH, you're not going on inhibin, you're not going on estrogen, you're not going on any endocrinal dysfunction or andral follicle count. What's most important to you to be lab to label any female with menopause is the menses. So that becomes the principal criteria. Reproductive life may you have variable kind of menstrual cycle in everybody, but mostly regular, right? Around the time when you have menstrual transition, it becomes subtle changes in flow length, subtle changes in the uh, you know in the flow and the length of the periods. And the gap as well. And then, you know, variable length, sometimes persistent then, you know, more than seven days difference in the length of consecutive cycles. Then comes amenorrhea. Sometimes amenorrhea is for two, three months and then heavy cycle. Then becomes five, six months and then heavy cycle. And then starts a period of amenorrhea. So all varied combinations are there in this particular phase, which is called as the menstrual transition or the perimenopause. What about postmenopause? It's usually pretty stable. There is no menses. Okay, so you don't have to tell me what are the specific principal criteria of causing, calling it a menopausal stage, 12 consecutive uh, cycles with amenorrhea. Supportive criteria, you have all the uh, hormones you can think of, FSH, AMH, inhibin, and the antral follicle count. They are supportive criteria which will, um, you know, kind of associate a patient who is undergoing this menopause with, uh, you know, this uh, criteria that yes, they are also raised. Patient is also not having periods. That means most probably going towards menopause. And then certain descriptive characteristics like symptoms. Patient is having hot flushes. Okay, patient is having some cognitive mood disorders. So these are all supportive symptoms. Then so that was straw 2011. Now I'm giving you a brief uh, tour as to what. See, Abhi, the, right now I'm starting to discuss the symptoms of menopause. What's going on in the menopause. Okay, so how important it is. There are, I think, five, six slides on this alone. Impact of estrogen deficiency and how it causes, you know, various disorders, which are all symptoms of menopause. So there are certain early symptoms, there are certain late changes, and there are certain later disease. Do you know the later disease the most, most dangerous? Osteoporosis, cardiovascular disorders, dementias, cancers, they're all different features of estrogen deficiency, but you know, years after menopause, okay? Late physical changes like, you know, immediately the patient when, you know, the, the estrogen deficiency is there, uh, the immediate, what happens immediately to a patient? Starts having hot flushes. This is called vasomotor symptom. So hot flushes, insomnia, irritability, mood disturbances. These are the things which happen immediately, you know, within weeks of uh, menopause. Later on, maybe after a couple of months to years, you have this, sexual dysfunction because of dryness, itching, stress urinary incontinence, connective tissue changes because of which, you know, this genitourinary syndrome. So this was vasomotor, genitourinary, and then later on, multiple disorders like cancer and osteoporosis and CVD. Now, <clears throat> what is the physiology? This was also a question asked. Endocrinological changes causing menopause. So how do you like this slide, guys? Do, would you like to read this? And what about this slide? 
so i would love to read something like this if you write something like this in the examination you have increased my burden of checking the paper okay i will not like a student like this i will like a student like this but remember one thing a short form should not be that short that examiner has to you know put more brain into understanding what you have written rather than maybe going through this slide okay so okay oocyte number decreases with age okay because of atresia because of apoptosis because of aging what's happening is oocyte number is decreasing and by late 30s or early 40s ovaries they become start becoming devoid of follicles which is the reason why ivf becomes a little more difficult with patients in their late 30s early 40s so because of this decrease in follicles because of a decrease in the amh hormone estrogen and inhibition also start decreasing oh, okay there is a decreased uh, production from the granulosa cell of estrogen and inhibition and that finally inhibits the inhibitory feedback so that causes an inhibitory feedback you know what happens is that you know you are you got less of estrogen less of inhibit so it's giving a negative feedback to the hypothalamus and to the pituitary so suddenly they realize oh my god we need to increase the work there's no uh, estrogen at all in the body so gnrh increases fsh and lh also increase okay which is the uh, you know hormonal changes that you will find during menopause one very important thing which the examiner wants to know over here is that the estrogen milieu that changes okay so there is a reversal of e2 is to e1 ratio now what is e2 in e1 e2 is estradiol the 80 times potent estrogen okay estradiol more potent than estriol far more potent than estron estron is the most abundant or predominant estrogen of menopause and it is called as a very weak estrogen okay but in east but in menopause you will find it in an abundance so the examiner also wants to hear this from you so what happens what are the hormonal changes that take place so you have to speak about that you know estradiol usually what is the ratio 2 is to 3 is to 1 that's the potency most important is estradiol then comes estriol then comes estron estradiol estriol estron repeat after me estradiol estriol and then estron but what happens in case of menopause is that estrogen suddenly becomes the predominant hormone and the most potent hormone is somehow washed off cleaned it's not in in par right now also lh and fsh have increased four folds at the time of menopause okay and because you have an ovulatory cycle there is no progesterone production so there are so many hormones i've spoken about i've spoken about fsh i've spoken about lh i've spoken about amh i've spoken about estrogen i've spoken about inhibin and now i'm talking about progesterone so ovarian stroma is still producing some estrogen some androgens adrenals are producing androgens okay i just took a class on adrenal hormones so you do know that androgens are produced okay these androgens they converted to weak estrogen estron okay which is uh, in the peripheral adipose tissue especially in obese so what happens in a uh, in in the uh, obese patient in whom we have a you know uh, the scare of uh, breast carcinoma endometrial carcinoma in them you know this conversion of you know adipose tissue androgen to estrogen continues because the adipose tissue is right there okay so this continuous continuous conversion keeps taking place so there is always a no estrogen deficient environment in an in a obese patient even in menopause okay no matter how how weak the uh, estrogen is so you should know that as well again see like i said so many slide on just the symptoms alone so immediate effects are like i said before menstrual symptoms most important vasomotor symptoms the mood disturbances cognitive dysfunction sexual dysfunction which comes you know immediately the moment the see occur in menopausal transition early parts of menopause within weeks to months these symptoms are going to come not just this alone headache dizziness palpitation breast engorgement bone and joint pain even urinary incontinence sometimes dysuria uh, frequency not stress but frequency yes and then there are intermediate effects occurs after a few years i would say months to years after menopause has set in like genital atrophy you know now comes a urinary tract atro uh, atrophy causing uh, you know urinary incontinence the stress urinary incontinence see if it's too itchy that area the detrosa muscle becomes more uh, stressed okay because of this continuous irritation in it so you have what is called as oap overactive bladder 
uh, not exactly the stress urinary incontinence, but also this overactive bladder syndrome. So you have to be very sure when you're dealing with a patient whether it is stress urinary incontinence or overactive bladder, okay? Prolapse, yes. Dry, itchy skin. And then, of course, a delayed dangerous signs which take place long-term effects like osteoporosis, cardiovascular defects, CNS effects, and then, of course, you're all kinds of cancers which can take place. So then comes this uh, Kupperman score. <clears throat> Again, one thing which I can ask as an examiner, you know, to... Assess how much the students are studying, how much they are they know the complete thing about uh, any chapter that they are doing. So, Kupperman score, they love to ask you these, uh, you know, scores, different terminologies, different studies. Uh, one of the favorite questions. Though this time the paper was pretty, pretty good, but we'll talk about it later. So, Kupperman score is actually now very important is that it's based on psychophysiological symptoms. Okay. It's taking into account, see what all it's taking. Sweating and hot flushes, paresthesias, insomnia, nervousness, melancholia, feeling of doom, you know, vertigo, fatigue, arthralgia, mal these are all subjective, these are all subjective symptoms. If you've been to this menopausal clinics, we had menopausal clinic from a very really long time in our hospital. If you ask this patient who's come to you, do you feel tired all the time? She'll say yes. Do you, do you feel irritable? Yes, yes, yes. And if they are so happy to describe these symptoms to somebody, at least somebody is listening. Most of the females, they have this lack of empathy at home. So when they do get to, uh, you know, kind of voice it out to people who understand, they say yes to all the symptoms you ask them. Then comes the severity. So that symptom is definitely there. What is the severity? Is it not there? Zero. Is it sometimes, once in a while, you know, once in a while you're feeling you did not sleep properly at night. You are having, you know, this muscle cramps or arthralgia or you had a headache. Once in a while or frequently does it happen? So there's a severity scale of two. Or it's affecting your lifestyle. So nobody is asking you to draw this, uh, you know, table. The same thing I like to say for straw 2011 as well. You don't have to ratify and remember and put it. As examiners, even we will not remember what it was, which scoring was given where. But we would definitely like to know whether you have an idea of what is asked or not. So even if you write that modified Kupperman index is based on psychosocial symptoms and you don't even write these symptoms, you write something else. You know, maybe instead of paresthesia, you feel you write numbness. Okay. Insomnia, you're, you know, disturbed sleep, mood swings. Okay. I will give you marks because it's based on all uh, subjective symptoms mostly. Okay. Which you, only you can ask the patient, they'll say, and you have to believe it. Right. So that was government score. And mind you, 